So I'm, uh, you know, I'm trying to bring, bring her up to take over for me, but she doesn't want to do it, so do pray for her also. <laughs> and, I, I, you know, my family, have been, they've been behind me 100%, you know, so just tell uh, Should I come and say something to me, so go say something to them. That's what I meant. And also, uh, the other people that I don't, I have a big list here, so I don't know who I miss, but uh, if anybody I miss, I'm really sorry. And uh, some of the announcements I have here for the upcoming meetings, I just want to, well, I'm sorry, I want to mention about the books behind, but the Phillips that he traveled all over from Canada to uh, bring those books, those books of, like Dane was saying, they are really, very valuable to, uh, for us reading. I don't know how many people read these days, but those of who read, please go visit that bookstore and buy some of these books from him. Also, I want to thank Jacob Sam. You know, Jacob's been not a stranger to us. Him and his wife drove down from Detroit to uh, broadcast the stuff for us. He also bought a family from Detroit, uh, Johnson and family. Thank you for you guys also for coming. Bring more people from down there. You know, we, you're welcome to come down to Southwest. And also move to Texas. We have more people moving to Texas than any other state. So, so please bring more families to uh, Texas. And the reminder about the other conference. IBF conference is coming in a couple of weeks. Also, FIBA conference. So please do go attend those conferences also. We're not partial to anyone, we support everyone. So please do go attend those conferences also. Okay, and also, uh, there's another, another meeting coming in, uh, in August, uh, uh, August 9th and 10th, but John Green is going to be in Dallas. And also August 10 and 17, but the Joseph Murphy is going to be in Dallas. So we, the first meeting is going to be at a, a Believer's Bible Chapel in Carrollton. And the second one is going to be a Vanessa Bible Chapel, uh, August 9 and 10. There will be more flyers to be given out to the, the folks in Dallas. Guys from Oklahoma and Houston also welcome to come for those meetings also. And the, uh, our Dallas area VBS will be from July 8 to 13, 6.30 p.m. Uh, please attend those. If you have children, please send your children for the VBS program. It's going to be in Carrollton, Believers Bible Chapel, uh, July uh, 8 to 13. Anybody get something there? Okay, okay, anybody else? I forgot. I'm really sorry. And um, I do thank all of you all for being here. I want to thank all the audience, I mean, all the participants, you know. One thing you have, every year I complain, you know, we got 320 people registered at the last year of the conference. I put 670 chairs right now. I don't know where the rest of you guys come from. At least for next year. Please, you know, you know I'm, I'm going to leave you all, so please register. At least register. Even if you're not coming, you can always cancel. Please do register. Our next year's conference is going to be from uh, June 12 to 14 next year. So mark your calendar, I'll give you a one year warning. So next year, June 12 to 14, the conference is going to be here one more year. So please do want to your conference I to attend. And uh, I'm also, you know, this year has been a very bad year for, I mean, a very rough year for a lot of us, you know. I remember about 20 years ago, I was going through a little rough times, and three guys came to my house one day, and I, was, I used to have a Commodore 64 computer. I don't know if anybody remember that. That was Brother Moni, Moni Chan and George Green and John Joseph came to my house one, you know, said that, uh, they were the office bears that year. Moni Chan especially told me that, hey, hey guy, you know, you know, I want you to step up and help. So they were using typewriters then, that's what I really. <laughs> but the encouragement I got from those three guys is, you know, that's why I'm still standing here. I mean, they're all three of them are kind of father's figure to me. That was, that was 20 years ago. It's time for the, some of you younger guys to step up. Please, we need a lot of help. Because you know, the next generation is you guys. The people who pass 50 and up, you know, some of you 25 and 30 year old guys, you guys are smart. You, you know, you're not using typewriters anymore. You're not using Commodore 64. You're engineers, you know. You got the technology. You can, you can design websites. You can sing. I humbly request to you one time, please step forward and help our conference in the days ahead, so we can continue this great tradition in the days ahead. Also, I really want to uh, mention some of the families, that, especially Brother Joseph Pondman and his family, and also Brother Sam, uh, his family in Houston. And I really uh, appreciate Brother Warrickan and uh, Babes are coming today. We will continue to pray for our uh, uh, dead Indian family in the days ahead. And, and as, as all of you, are, please remember all these families and they ahead in your prayers. And our uh, Brother Rex will be uh, coming to pray. I just open the word, but a couple of more reminders. Please keep this area kind of clean. Uh, we like to have our auditorium back. And also, when you go back to your uh, rooms, uh, take your trash and if you can leave it outside, they will really appreciate it. Also, leave your door open. So they want to come right after clean uh, our rooms. So they have another, another group is already here. They want to come in. So the meeting will be over a little early ahead of schedule. And uh, Rex promised me that he's going to stop by 11.30. So. As soon as you, those of you stay in the hotel rooms, please go in there and check, then come and have your lunch. And that's all the announcement I have. Thank you again for all of you for coming. We'll hope to see you again next year. 
Uh, June 12 to 14. I will ask Brother Rex to come forward and open the word, and Brother Paley will give us close to our conference of prayer after that. Thank you very much. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. Did your Bible fall open to Jude already? <laughs> That's what we're hoping and praying. As you get comfortable with your Bible open, I just want to express my appreciation to the conveners of the conference and to every one of you for being here and for the great privilege you've given me to be part of the conference together with you. We trust that it's been a blessing to you. We know that God honors his word. It will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish the very purpose for which he sent it. It will do his pleasure, and we want to cooperate with that. As we come to the end of the book of Jude, we're going to read the last two verses. This basically is what is referred to as the doxology in Jude. I'm just going to make a little adjustment here. And there we go. The doxology has to do with that God would get the glory and that he pronounces a blessing on his word to us. And so as we read this doxology, take it to our hearts and push it right up into glory that he might receive all the honor that's due unto his name. For Jude writes at the end of his book in verse 24 saying, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Shall we ask the Lord to guide us once again in his word? Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would take the things that we've just read in your word, bless them to our hearts, give us good understanding, and as we meet together this one more time, Father, we pray that you would take your word to do your work, to fulfill your will in our lives, and we promise, Father, to give you the honor and glory that's due unto you, for we pray this in the name of your wonderful Son, our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to take this phrase, He is able, and we're going to build up to the verses we've just read. Because this great statement, He is able, is brought to us back in a, on the occasion when the Lord Jesus met with two men who were blind. Please turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. And in Matthew chapter 9, I would like you to notice that as these men came to the Lord, they made a request, but he asked them a question. With the Lord's help, I would like that question to be presented to our hearts. It may be a different need that we have compared to these men, but whatever your need is, let the Lord ask you this question to your own heart. Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 and also 28. Matthew 9, 27 says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And verse 28 says, And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Is that your answer to him? Let's take some time just to consider what he is able to do. And we have seven different portions of scripture. I know there's not a translation for, to Malayalam for you, but if you have a difficult time following my English. I know I have a little different accent from East Texas, North Carolina that is. But if you have trouble following the accent or the language, why not get a, a 
friend close to you that can just help you walk through these seven different verses that remind us that God is able. And as we look at each one, you mark that down in your heart to say, I know that he is able, he is able, I know he is able, I know that my Lord will see me through. And so we'll start all the way to the very first one that we're going to look at, and you'll find it in the book of Hebrews chapter 7. We were in the book of Hebrews chapter 7 a few times today already, and it's a great blessing to know this book that was written as a bridge between the old and the new brings before us the Lord Jesus Christ, and it tells us the reason that he came and what he is able to do, and we start at the very beginning of our need. And in Hebrews chapter 7, please notice in verse 25, it tells us, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Think just for a moment. The greatest need that we had was salvation. We were lost. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And while we were still helpless, while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. He laid down his life for us in order to save us. <laughs> we have been saved, as it tells us, not only to the uttermost, but I want to tell you, we've been saved from the guttermost. That's exactly right. Where have we been saved from? The psalmist said in Psalm 40, He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock, established my goings, and has put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. One favorite friend of mine down south said, The believer, based on those two verses I just quoted from the Psalms, he said the believer has been brought up, set up, kept up, and tuned up to sing God's praise. It's all because he saved us when we were in our lowest state. We were dead in our trespasses, and the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, that we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. That's exactly how he saved us, from the guttermost. Second Corinthians 1 goes on to say that he delivered us from so great a death. Now, how did he do that? Well, he had so great a love, and he gave us so great salvation. He delivered us from so great a death, and he does deliver us, not only in the past from so great a death, but right now in the present, he does deliver us, and look at the future, he will yet deliver us. Did you know you had a three-tenth salvation? Past, I have been saved. Present, I am being saved. Future, I will be saved. In the past, I'm saved from sin and its penalty. In the present, I'm saved from sin and its power. One day, praise God, I'll be saved in the future from sin in his very presence. Never to sin again. I'll love him with unsinning heart. Why? Because he is able to save from the guttermost. But he not only saved us from the guttermost, he saved us to the uttermost, as we read in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. I know one person was. Aren't you glad for that? I mean, what will it be to dwell above? Well, here's what the scripture says. Eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But the little bit that has been revealed to us by the Spirit, it's amazingly wonderful, isn't it? Just to think, what will it be when we realize what all he has accomplished for us, saved to the uttermost. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe he's able to do this? Amen. Yes. He's mighty to save. 
His arm is not shortened that it cannot save. There's no one that's unreachable because our God is the Savior who is able, say it with me, to save to the uttermost. I'm glad that's where we start. He is able to save. Not only that, but let me have you turn, please, because that was dealing with our salvation. Let me have you turn, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, he tells us in the scriptures that he is also able to keep us. Look, please, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, this is what the Apostle Paul wrote. And he reminds us it's not what you know, but who you know. For in 2 Timothy chapter 1, you'll notice in verse 12, this is what he writes to young Timothy. And it's a great help to us. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he writes, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Here we go. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him against that day. Since the invitation of our Savior went out so clearly that he said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. You can be assured that he is able to save and to keep what has been committed to him. We've committed to him our eternal destiny. And the last thing we would ever have to be concerned about is that we would ever lose this precious gift of salvation. God has given it to us freely, and he'll never take it back. God has promised, and he will not break his promise. We have his word on it. If we were not secure in our salvation, it would cast doubt on the faithfulness of God. But we know great is his faithfulness. Not only did he say, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He also said, he who believes in me, in John 6, 47, has, that means possesses right now, everlasting life. Someone said, I thought it was, I thought it was life until you sin again. I told him, I said, no, that's probation. This is life that's everlasting life. It's salvation. We have a Savior who is able to keep what has been committed to Him. And we are so secure. The, go the Gospel of John chapter 10, verse 28, the Lord Jesus said, All that come to me, all that the Father gives me, I will keep, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. And then He said, The Father who gave them me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. John 10, 30 says, I and my Father are one. Safe am I, safe am I in the hollow of His hand. Nothing can harm us. No fear or alarm us. We are safe forevermore. He gives us eternal life. That means the life of God living within us. For him to deny us would be to deny himself, and God cannot deny himself. We are so secure in Christ. A good friend of mine said, I'm so secure in Christ, I could swing over hell on a rotten pea vine and sing Amazing Grace the whole way. It's true. That's the last thing we would ever have to fear, that he would ever lose. He said, I have not lost one. One day he's going to stand and he's going to say, here I am and all the children that you have given me. Not one is missing when we come to appear before his presence. You'll be there if you know the Lord. You'll be there if you know the Lord. I'll be there because I know the Lord and he is able to keep what we've committed unto him against that day. You are in the safe double grip of God's great salvation and we are secure forever everlastingly. Nancy and I were traveling up in Pennsylvania in the nice area of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, if you've ever traveled up there. It's a beautiful area. We were going to meet somebody at Cracker Barrel for lunch. 
And we got there about 30 minutes early. Well, Nancy noticed the factory outlet shopping center. She said, I know what we can do. We can go into the factory outlet mall. I went along. She found the Lenox Crystal and China store. And she said, let's go into the China and Crystal store. Lenox has a nice thing. So we went in there. And as she went, she was looking for a sale. I went, and I was looking for a soul. <laughs> and we came through the door, and when we came in the door, there was this nice table display of all this different crystal, and there was a sign on it, and the name of the design was called Eternal. You know, you look for a sign from the Lord, there was a sign I had, it had Eternal on it. I thought, well, I could do something with that, but there was no one working in that area. So I saw a worker back in the back, and I went made my way back there. There was another table display, and on that table, a different design. It was called Eternity. And I thought, wait a minute, that was eternal up there. That's Eternity back there. And so I saw the worker, and I said, I have a question for you. I said, your display in the front says Eternal. Your display in the back says Eternity. I said, what's the difference between eternal and eternity? That's a good common ground, isn't it? She said, about $69. <laughs> I don't think she caught on to what I was saying. I want to tell you, there is a difference between eternal and eternity. Eternal is what God is doing in us. Eternity is what we're going to enjoy with Him forever and ever and ever. Aren't you glad? You don't have to worry. That one day in eternity, you're going to wake up or you're going to have a conversation and the Lord's going to say, you know, I was glad I saved you back then, but now I'm, I've changed my mind. No, no, no. We have the life of God in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and he'll never deny himself. We are safe as well as saved, salvation and security. But look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it's not just that we have salvation and we're secure in our salvation, knowing that we're going to spend eternity with Him, but on the way home to heaven, there is something that we need along the way. And so He also is able to make all grace abound toward us. Now we're saved by His grace, but this grace, it's an abounding grace, isn't it? Because where sin abounded, grace abounded, how? Much more. I love that phrase, much more. You find it five times in the book of Romans chapter five. You can remember it easy, chapter five, five times, much more, much more, much more. I got off the plane in Africa at a mission station up north of us, and I met a missionary who came out to the plane, and when he greeted me, he said, hello, Rex, my name is Don Muchmore. Much more? I said, I've read about you before. And he said, yeah, the book of Romans, I get it all the time. <laughs> I wish I had a name like much more. You know, I hear of names like, like Jonathan Goforth. You don't even have to ask him what he did for a living. He was a missionary and he went forth. Jonathan Goforth. Don't you wish you had a name like that? Well, I'll tell you what, we have a, something even better than that. We have a grace that is much more. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And we read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You'll notice in verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, here's our key verse. It tells us, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things, having an abundance for every good work. We see that grace is abounding. We also see that grace is abundant because when it comes to serving the Lord, the question is asked by the Apostle Paul, and I heard it this morning with the devotion with our brother Nate. He said, and who is sufficient for these things? The sufficiency is not in and of ourselves. For we're not sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God 
who is sufficient for all things and has made us sufficient as well. That same grace that brings salvation is the same grace that is able to sustain us and we say that his grace is the sufficiency that we need. Think about the Apostle Paul. He suffered some kind of difficulty called a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed three times that the Lord would take it away. The Lord answered him, no. He gave him something better. You know, God answers our prayers in one of three ways, either yes, no, I asked this to a group of junior campers one year. I said, God answers in three ways. He either says yes or no. And then I pause and I said, or, and a little girl in the back said, maybe. <laughs> no, it's not yes, no, or maybe. It's not even yes or no, go ask your mother. It's yes or no, or wait. Sometimes it's not a matter of the will of God. Sometimes it's just a matter of the timing. One day that thorn in the flesh would be taken away, but not yet. The answer is only no temporarily. We can change that answer to say wait. Because I guarantee you Paul doesn't have the thorn in the flesh now. But something better was given to Paul than the relief from the thorn in the flesh. God promised, he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Did it work? Yes. You better believe it worked. Yes. The Apostle Paul, listen to what he said. I am well content with my weaknesses, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. All because of God's abounding grace and the sufficiency we have the hymn writer said it so well. Listen to these words. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. The last verse. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, say it with me, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. We have super abounding grace. He is our sufficiency and he is able to make all grace abound. Turn once again to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 18. And in Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 18, I'll just remind you along the way, there is nothing that he cannot do. Jeremiah said, Oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. There is nothing too hard for you. And the Lord answered, Behold, I am the Lord the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Let me ask you the question. Do you believe that he is able? It's what he asked the blind man. It's what he's asking our hearts. Whatever the need is, do you believe that he is able? As we continue answering that question, look in Hebrews chapter two, verse 18. Hebrews chapter two, verse 18 reminds us of his priestly ministry because it tells us that he is able to come to our aid. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He died to finish the work, only to begin the unfinished work in heaven at God's right hand on your behalf and mine. And so in Hebrews chapter two, verse 18, he writes, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, 
going to change this word. It's the same word in the Greek, tested. He is also able, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You see, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But he was tested in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Let me clarify this. We have a sinless Savior. He's sinless because he could not sin. He could not sin and he would not sin. He is 100% Perfect, the Son of God not only could not sin and would not sin, he did not sin because he's the sinless, perfect Son of God. He could not even be tempted with evil, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he tempts no one. But when we are tested, and when we humans are tempted, because of all the testing that he went through, he understands our weaknesses, and he can come to our aid just when we need him. This is so certain that the scripture reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful and will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able but with the temptation, he will also make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. He is able to come to our aid and he enables us to be triumphant over whatever testing or temptation we face. Whether it's a testing of sadness or sorrow or of sickness or of distress, are overwhelming things. Listen, when the, the situation looks overwhelming, just remember you're an overcomer. That we have the victory and we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. What does it mean to be a more than a conqueror? Well, a conqueror is one who goes down into the battle and comes up triumphant. That's what the Lord Jesus did. He ran down into the battle and he won the victory, and now he's on high as the victor. But more than a conqueror, that's someone who gets all of the benefit from the victory of someone who has fought the battle for us and has made us because we're on his side. If God be for us, who can be against us? And we have the assurance that the victory is ours all because of him. Because of that. He is able to come to our aid. Now, when it comes to relating to us, I'd like to just point out that he identifies with us in regards to our infirmities or our weaknesses, not in regard to our iniquities. He didn't have to experience sin. He was made sin for us. And he took our sins away in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live unto him. We need his strength to make that possible. And he is able to come to our aid and supply all the strength that's needed. He has all of heaven's forces at his disposal. All it takes, even as he said in the garden to Simon Peter, do you not know that I could ask my father and he would give me 12 legions of angels? And he just waits for a look when we enter into temptation or go through times of testing. He just waits for a look. We call upon him. The way of escape opens up before us and all of heaven's resources are fighting on our behalf. Really, walking with him, we have it made, don't we? Because he is able to aid us and to supply the strength that is needed. Turn now to my favorite verse, Ephesians chapter 3. It might be your favorite verse as well. Ephesians chapter 3, because he is also able, as we look at this fifth statement of his great ability, he is also able to do and accomplish his work in us. 
Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 tells us, and it's also a doxology or a benediction, a blessing pronounced, because Paul gets to the end of this great statement in chapter 3, and he just can't contain himself, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. One little girl prayed, oh God, fill me with yourself. And then she said, I can't hold much, but I can overflow a whole lot. That's what we feel like, isn't it? And so he says, as he breaks forth into this blessing toward the Lord and prays in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Lord, let it be so. He is able to do he is able to do what? Let me give you the design of the little nice description in written form that came from William McDonald's excellent commentary, the Believer's Bible Commentary. Because there he breaks down, it's almost like, well, the way I have to do it to get all the words in, it's almost like a reading exam. Have you had a reading exam lately? You know, that's where you start out big and you end up small. Well, maybe you have to stop part way if you can't see clearly. And so we're going to do a reading exam just to make sure you can see clearly what he is able to do. So Mr. McDonald started with the first phrase from verse 20. Just that statement that we're looking at. He is able. And then it says he is able to do. We can all read that okay, right? Everybody's seeing pretty good. But then we have to go a little bit smaller because we're getting a little bit longer. He is able not only to do, he's able to do what we ask. That's what the Lord Jesus told his disciples. Up until this point, you've asked nothing. Ask in my name. You can go straight to the Father and ask for the Father himself loves you. He is able to do what we ask. Not only that, he knows our thoughts. He is able to do what we think. And if you put those together, you've got to... Multiply it out using higher math. He is able to do all that we ask or think. You know, sometimes I think that we hold back asking God hard things. And we need to pray God-sized prayers, don't we? There's nothing too hard for him. He is able to do all that we ask or think. But let's take it one more step. Some of you are squinting. <laughs> is it hard to see? Sometimes we lose sight of this. Because we think, I don't want to ask anything too hard. I don't want to overextend myself. No, take it all the way. And take it to Him. Because He is able to do above all that we ask or think. But that's not quite enough, is it? You may need your farsight glasses on now. Because our God is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. And this is going to separate the people that have clear spiritual vision. Anybody got 2020 spiritual vision here? I'll help you out with that in just a moment. The last statement says, He is able, are you ready for this? To do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout the world without end. Amen. Amen. Did you get 2020 vision on that? Are we seeing clearly now? If you didn't get 2020 vision, you just need to turn to John 2020. 2020 vision is seen clearly in John 20, 20. Let me tell you what it says. This is after the Lord Jesus suffered on the cross at Calvary. After he was buried. And when he was raised from the dead, he appeared to his own and he showed them his hands and his feet. And John 20, 20 in that upper room tells us, Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now that will give you 20, 20 vision. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. 
and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. That's our problem, isn't it? The world keeps getting in the way. And we take our eyes off of him. We see the wind and the waves and we start to go down. Put your eyes back on him. In the light of his glory and grace, may he fill all our vision and give us 2020 vision of himself. He is able to do his work. And this is the most amazing thing. Where? In us. That we might be equipped for the service that we render unto him who is able. He is working in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is at work in us. And he wants to do a work through us. He's already worked for us. And one day we'll see his work completed when we see him. And then we'll throw away the glasses. They gave me trifocals. You know why? You have to keep trying to get them right. <laughs> One day we won't need them. He'll fill all of our vision. I hope it's even today. 2020 vision. He is able. Sixthly, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, right next door to Ephesians from Galatians. Ephesians, Philippians chapter 3. Because now looking from a heavenly perspective, we are citizens, not of this world, but our citizenship is in heaven. And Philippians chapter 3 tells us this. Notice in verse 20 and 21. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also, and note, eagerly wait. That's tiptoe expectancy. He won't have to call me twice. We're waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which, here we go, he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Every time I get on an airplane, maybe you do the same. I always pray, Lord, lift us up in your power. And then I say, and set us down in your tender mercies. I mean, I look, you know, they, they started charging us for baggage, and now we all do carry-on. My carry-on bag, if they weighed it, they'd have probably disqualified it. You can get a lot in a carry-on. And I'm thinking, this plane was completely full. And the carry-on bins are also full with heavy bags. I saw this trip, I never noticed it before. There's a sticker up inside that overhead bin that said the maximum weight is 84.3 pounds. And I see five different carry-ons in there and I know they all weigh 50 pounds. <laughs> and I'm thinking as we're rolling down the runway, it's a lot of weight to pick up. Are we gonna get off the ground? And I pray, Lord, lift us up in your power. Now you think about it. Right here, if the Lord were to come, I know Roji said 250 signed up, 500 are here, that's okay. You think, you think if the Lord were to come right now, he'd have any trouble getting us up off the ground? It'll be a commotion, a call, and that'll be all right. We'll hear his voice, we'll see his face, and we'll be changed and taken up in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will be raised first. You think he can raise all the dead in Christ? Yes. Someone said when he said, Lazarus, come forth. If he had not said the name of Lazarus, all the dead would have come forth. Yeah. One day, all those who are dead in Christ, those who are asleep in Jesus, he's going to raise up. I'd love to be doing a graveside service at that moment, wouldn't you? And see all the graves open up with believers. And we'll all go up together. And then those who, of us who are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up together with them that are asleep in Jesus and we're going to meet him in the air. Is he able to do this? It tells us that he is able to subdue. That means he has the power and control and authority over all things. We have a sovereign Lord who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He can say it and it's done. Someone asked me, they said, do you think God really created everything in six days? I said, I was only wondering why it took him so long. <laughs> He is able. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father because he is able to subdue all things 
by his sovereign right. And then back to the book of Jude, please. And in Jude, he tells us, as we read in verses 24 and 25, it is a doxology. We're going to look in Jude and then we just are going to go back to Matthew and finish it all out. Jude, verses 24 and 25. Now to him, and here we go, who is able to keep you from stumbling or from falling. This is very practical. Jude is an amazing book, isn't it? I mean, we've gone through all the way back in the Old Testament, all the way to the beginning in Genesis with Abel and with Cain and the children of Israel in Exodus all the way through Numbers. We've looked at the sons of Korah in the book of Numbers as well. We've gone all the way through with Michael and Moses and as we've made our way through, now we come down to the very practical closing and in of all things, in the doxology or the benediction of the closing of the book, he gets extremely practical. And this is what he says. He is able to keep you from falling. Not only can he keep us from falling. Did you notice that next statement in verse 24? And to present you faultless. We who are up to our ears of our sinfulness, he's cleansed us every bit. And he sees in us not one stain, not one wrinkle, but he presents us to himself as a bride that's been completely cleansed by his precious blood and that ongoing work of cleansing us by the water of the word. He is able, Paul writes to the believers at Rome, in Romans, in Romans chapter 16, he is able to establish you. In other words, the same thing. You have no need to fear that you're going to stand before him and be embarrassed. Why? Because you're going to be covered with a righteous robe of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is able to keep us from stumbling and give us that stability in life that we need daily. And so we come all the way back to the gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 9, let's finish up where we started out. Matthew chapter 9, you remember those two blind men we read about? They came into the house, and in verse 28, we read, this is Matthew chapter 9, verse 28, and when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And we ask the question to our own hearts. Of all the things we've been talking about, do you believe he's able? They said unto him, yes, Lord. If you said unto him, yes, Lord. Or if you were still, well, maybe. No. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Yes, we believe. Here's what he answered in verse 29. Then he touched their eyes. May you know his touch today. And he said, according to your faith, let it be to you. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. To close, let me just ask you, what would you say to him who is able to do all this? Here's what you'd have to say. Verse 25 of Jude 1, it says, To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Now, when you said amen, here's what you said. You just committed and you expressed your conviction. Lord, let it be so. As I close in prayer, why not say that amen one more time? To know this is what God is able to do. I'm committing my life to this. Trusting His ability to work in us for His honor and glory. May the Lord bless His word to our hearts. 
and our brother's going to come and close in prayer, and we'll say our amens when he finishes his prayer.